Welcome back. Um, this is an additional section um, in this chapter um, that's based on some new material in the, in the second edition of the book. And it's called Matrix Completion and, and Missing Values. It's often the case that data matrices X have missing entries, which are often represented by NA, not available. So this is a nuisance since many of our modeling procedures, especially multivariate procedures such as linear regression and GLMs, require complete data, as do principal components. However, sometimes imputation is the prediction problem. And we're going to see that in the next example in what's known as recommender systems. So one simple approach when you've got missing data is mean imputation. So you replace the missing entries for a variable by the mean of the non-missing entries. So if X is a matrix, that means in each column, which represents, say, a variable, you replace all the missing entries by the mean of the non-missing entries in that column. However, this ignores the correlations amongst the variables. We should be able to exploit the correlations when imputing missing values. And clearly, if you just use the mean in, in, for each variable, you're ignoring the, the correlations. We also need to assume that the missing values are missing at random, i.e. the missingness should not be informative. So we're going to present an approach that's based on principal components for imputing missing values. Just tell you a little bit about recommender systems. So what we have here is part of a, a spreadsheet which shows customers who rented movies from the Netflix um, movie rental company. And along the top, we see names of movies. You can see Jerry Maguire, Oceans, Road to Perdition, and so on. And most of the matrix are little gray dots, which means that customer didn't see that movie. But the places where they're numbers, the customer was asked to rate the movie after they saw it with a rating between one and five. I think, I think one was the worst and five was best, right? Five was, yes, right. And with other numbers in between. And so you can see there's a few threes and fours and ones and fives, right? So a very small fraction. In this data set, they were actually, this was a data set that was put out there for a competition. And it actually was one of the, the it was really the start of these online uh, competitions, prediction competitions. And the data set had 400,000 users. So we only show nine customers here. And 18, over 18,000 movies. So it's a massive matrix. But only 2% of the matrix had numbers in it. And the rest were missing. Well, that competition was around 2005, Trevor, right? And, yeah. And... There was a first, um, one million dollar first prize for the first team that could get, could improve upon the uh, existing system by by at least ten percent. Yeah, and it caused a huge excitement in the machine learning and statistics communities. And as I recall, we won that, right? <laughs> we so, won that. No, we no. didn't win it. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> we did. We did go into it thinking we might win, but yeah. after a few months, we realized this was really hard. That the data was so big, it was just hard to. to to get anywhere with it, we got, I think we got down to maybe close to what the current system was, but we didn't get anywhere near the, exactly. the finish line. Yeah, so yeah. Th the thing was Netflix themselves had a recommender system, right. and, uh, and the goal of the competition was to make predictions for movies that people hadn't seen, what their rating would be. And they, the, 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 the winning team was the first to beat the, the Netflix um, recommend a system by 10% in root mean squared error. It took about three years for someone to win. Three years, yeah. and there were approximately 40,000 teams all over the world submitting entries to this competition. And, and the methods that were used were very, there was a huge variety, but the method we're about to show you is actually the basis of, a lot of the systems use the method we're going to show you right now as its first step. Exactly. Right. So that's why the method we're going to show you is, is, is one of the important techniques out there and it's worth knowing about. Okay, so let's get into the details. And the idea is we're going to use the principal component model to do the imputation. In section 12.2.2 of the book, 
we gave an interpretation of principal components in terms of matrix approximation. You see there that we've got a sum over the rows and the columns, and we have the, the difference between each entry, xij, and then an internal sum over the number of components. So here we're using, we're going to use m principal components of a product of terms, a, i, m, b, j, m. May look rather technical, because it, it is. And these a, i's and b, j's are elements of a matrix. So we have a matrix A, which is going to be n by m, n being the number of rows. And we have a matrix B, which is p by m, which p being the number of columns or variables. And these are the entry, individual entries of those matrices. And what this is basically saying is that we're going to approximate a matrix X by the product of these two matrices. And this is shown element by element. And we want to uh, minimize this over A and B. Okay, so this, this is a, another interpretation of principal components. Because it can be shown that for any value M, the first M principal components provide a solution for A. So these, these are the principal component scores, the Zs. And for the Bs, it's a principal component loadings. So principal components give us a solution to this problem. Now we say provides a solution because I think it should be evident that I can alter the solution by multiplying all the A's by some number, let's say S, say bigger than one, and divide all the B's by the same number and I'll get the same solution, right? So there's some arbitrariness here, multiplicative arbitrariness. But the principal component is one such solution, okay? So that's just an interpretation of principal components as a matrix approximation, best matrix approximation, the terminologies of rank M, okay? But what do we do if the matrix has missing elements? Well, this is where the technique arises for imputing missing values. So what we do is impose instead a, a modified version of this approximation criterion. The outside looks the same. We want an A and a B. But now, of course, some of the XIJs are missing. So what we do is we just sum the sum of squares over the IJ pairs that are observed. And we've got this little symbol, script O, which is a set of all observed pairs of indices IJ, which is a subset of, of the possible, all the possible N times P pairs. So we've still got the sum of squares, but of course only over the elements that we observed. But importantly, the A and B are still these full matrices. So once we solve this problem, we've got a solution. We can estimate a missing observation XIJ using the same sum that we had before, element Y sum, for the pair XIJ, but now putting in the estimates for A and B. So it seems simple. We can also, in doing this, we not only impute the missing values, but we can approximately recover the M principal component scores and loadings as if the data were complete. So Rob, it's, it's both a method for computing principal <coughs> components when you've got missing values and for imputing the missing values in the matrix. Now you mentioned in the beginning that using mean imputation is maybe a good start, but it doesn't exploit correlations. How does this somehow uh, capture correlations? Well, it, I think Robert captures correlations in the same way as principal components do. So principal components you know, exploit the correlations when finding linear combinations that maximize variance. And in terms of these approximations, you know, the principal components, well, let's suppose you've got some rows um, in the matrix or columns in the matrix that, let's think of columns, that are correlated with each other. Well, if one of those columns have got missing values, you might think you should be able to do a regression of that column on the other columns to impute the missing values. And that's exactly what's going on in this matrix, in, in this matrix completion problem, using those correlations. And I guess going back to the movie example, you, you're hoping that customers uh, respond to similar movies in a similar way. Is that right? That's a that's yeah. a good yeah. point, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, so even with this sparse number of uh, entries here, yeah. um, it's just as Rob says. 
what what you're hoping is that when you know that there are enough customers who've seen a movie that you haven't seen who've got scores for that movie and as long as those customers have overlapped with you um, in some of the other movies you've made you can you can find out to what extent you, you know you agree with them and and use those correlations to fill in the missing values so exploring both similarity in customers and similarity in movies at the same time yes right. that's exactly right and and that's a, a, of course due to the the wonderful symmetry in principal components we can now now give you a, an algorithm for for solving this problem we've shown what we'll do if we can solve it and now we're going to tell you how to solve it and it's an extremely simple algorithm. It's an iterative algorithm, and it goes as follows. You start off, you could create a complete data matrix X tilde by filling in the missing values with any method, say mean imputation, is a good start. And then you're going to repeat these next three steps until the objective fails to decrease. And this is the objective. It's the same one we had on the, on the previous slide. So what you do is now you've got X tilde is a complete matrix. You solve the matrix approximation uh, problem for a complete matrix. And we know we can do that using principal components. So we use the principal components of X tilde. Now what you do is for each missing entry, you again replace the entries in the matrix X tilde, the missing entries, with the current approximation that you've just computed. Remember, in the beginning, we just put in the mean values. Now we've got a, a better value to put in, and so we replace those entries. And then we see how well we're doing. This, this quantity will, will get smaller each time we do that. And then we go back and do it again. So you keep on filling in with your, your newest guess, and then you solve the, the full matrix approximation and, and get new guesses. And this will converge, and this quantity will, will bottom out and finally uh, level off, and then you'll declare yourself done, and then you'll re return the missing entries um, in XIJ. Very simple, just iterative principal components. So we'll use the USA arrest data as an example. So it's a small matrix, this one. X has 50 rows, the states, and four columns, which are the, the different types of, of crime. So there's murder, assault, rape, and then there's the variable urban population, percent of the population um, in that state that lives in, in urban areas, right? So this data set is complete. So we, we artificially made some elements missing. We selected 20 states at random, and for each, we selected one of the variables at random and set its value to NA. So that means out of the 50 states, we now had 20 states where there was one element missing in one of the variables, all selected at random. And we used m equals one principal components in the algorithm. So we just use a single principal component to do the imputation. And what we show in this plot is a plot of, on the x-axis, the original value, and on the y-axis, the imputed value. And since the, the variables for which there was missing were missing we selected them randomly for these states. What we show you here is the 20 states for which there are missing values. The color is what variable was missing. And we just show the imputed value versus the original value. And you can see there's a bit of noise. It doesn't get perfect. But there's a correlation of 0.63 between the original and imputed values. And what's interesting is if you used for the complete data, if you used the first principal component to approximate these same values, you'd get a correlation of 0.73 or 0.72, something like that. You know, so the fact that we were missing these guys and we had, to, we had to estimate the principal component in the presence of missing values didn't degrade the solution much. This was a small example, only four variables, which is on the low end for this method to work well. And so for this reason, and for this demonstration, we randomly set at most one variable per state to be missing and we only used m equals one principal component. In general, in order to apply the algorithm, we must select m, the number of principal components, to use for the for imputation, because we don't know in advance what's a good number going to be. You can imagine if you make it too big, you're gonna, you may overfit in, in the training and not do well on the prediction. It turns out there's a, a way of doing this automatically using the same method. 
So what you do is randomly set to NA some additional elements that were actually observed and select M based on how well these known values are recovered. So this is very close to the validation set approach um, that we saw in chapter five. So again, even though you got some elements missing in the matrix, you make a few more missing and just at random, and then you run your algorithm. But for those that you've artificially made missing, you know their true value, so you can see how well you're doing and you'll get something like a cross-validation curve. So there's a package in R called Soft Impute, which implements matrix completion algorithms and can manage really large problems. In fact, Netflix scale matrices. So if we'd had that in 2005, we would have... If we'd had that, we'd have had a shot. we might have had a better shot. Okay. Yeah. So that's it on, on matrix completion.